Today I'm going to talk about a study I undertook which focused on the developing identities of seven high school mathematics teachers as they partook in a professional development opportunity that was structured as a community of practice, which we'll talk a little bit more about, and uh, also focused on preparing these teachers for teaching math for social justice, which is something else that we're going to talk a little bit about. So the reason I became interested in this area was through issues of equity in mathematics. And the more familiar I got with that, the more interesting it sounded. Um, as a high school math teacher in a very poor performing school in the New York City public school systems, I often saw these intentions of equity that are, for instance, in this position uh, statement by the National Council of Teachers of Math, kind of shoved up against the reality of what was happening in our classrooms. Um, and so I fear that many of the students in my school left underprepared, underchallenged, and marginalized, especially as compared to their more mainstream peers in other schools. Um, I also have a habit, so you know, of not reading what's up there. Uh, so if I talk through it and you missed it, let me know and we'll back up. The idea is that I think you all can read, and if not, I'd like to believe you all can read. Uh, so, I have a few, I call them sad statistics, with respect to the inequities in math education. Um, and while these kind of focus on mathematics education, I imagine that one can see that there are social inequities along these lines as well that exist. All right, so the study is embedded in the following context. First, in the reality of the statistics that we just encountered. Um, next, in the fact that many education scholars argue that mathematics, and particularly algebra, stands as a gatekeeper for future success um, in life. That is, that if you don't have a thorough understanding of algebra, you might be limited in life and not do as well as someone who has this understanding. Uh, one of the reasons is that math is relied on for all of these exams to get you to the next place. Uh, in the beginning, when my students would say, well, what am I going to use this for? I always tried to come up with a really good example. Well, you're going to own a business one day, and you're going to want to uh, chart your profits, and da, da, da. And eventually, I said, you know what? If you want to get to college, someone deemed that this is important, so you might as well learn it. Um, if they had deemed that dancing was important, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> but they did math, so that's what happened. Um, it's also a gatekeeper to uh, like civil service exams and things like that. And this uh, gatekeeper role of math is especially evident for low-income students of color that for the whole talk are going to be referred to as students from marginalized communities. Uh, if you have a better, you can let me know. I've been working on that one. Um, and th this is the population that the teachers in the study also worked with. Um, next is this idea that math for social justice can be used as a way of uh, challenging these inequities, but more than that, also challenging the inequities that exist in society. Um, addressing these through mathematics um, is something that I think is both uh, viable and worthwhile. The next question, or one question, is, well, we're going to have a whole talk on math for social justice. We might as well figure out what the heck social justice is. Um, and you can disagree which is fine. There you go. Um, so since this is the topic we're discussing, it makes sense, I think, to define what a socially just society might be. And as you can imagine, there are a lot of different discrepancies between what people think um, with respect to this. And the teachers and I, our very first meeting was centered around this question. We had nice, very heated arguments about what we, what we meant. Uh, so drawing from the work of Michelli, who is actually on my dissertation committee, a very, very good education scholar at the CUNY Graduate Center, um, and Kaiser, they wrote about education in a democracy. And that, coupled with this idea from uh, this gentleman named Rorty about distributive justice, basically uh, the idea that resources of all types should be equally distributed, um, that leads to the, the topmost bullet point there. And in addition to that, I rely on Gutierrez, this is um, Rochelle Gutierrez, also pretty well known in, in this area, although a lot uh, younger, you know, sort of getting started. Uh, she argued that equity in education is being unable to predict student patterns like achievement, participation, uh, ability to critically analyze data based solely on characteristics such as race, class, ethnicity, gender, beliefs, and proficiency in the dominant language. 
And if we expand on that, not just looking at success in education, but success in life in general, we can come up with this second, this second bullet point, which takes all of those characteristics and says, let's say that success in life can't be predicted based on any of these. It's really sad, and I can't tell you exactly where I read it, that the best predictor of a student's success in school tends to be the zip code where they live, which there's something wrong with that. All right. So the theoretical framework on which the study rests is here. There's the math for social justice, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later. What is it? What does it look like? Uh, the idea of teachers working in a community of practice, sometimes they're called teacher networks. Uh, also issues of identity, developing identities, conflicting identities, things like that. And then um, teacher development. So those are just a few of the, the notable people in those areas. If anyone's interested afterwards, um, you know, for either articles or a list of, of the things that are cited, you just let me know. All right, we're good? Okay. Uh, so teaching math for social justice has its roots in the idea that education can be a means for liberation and that as such, teaching is a political act. And this stems from the work of Paulo Freire, uh, whose quote here points to the political nature of teaching, actually of anything, um, it's pretty much where he's going. And when we say, no, 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 that, that can't be right. I'm teaching some abstract math concepts and it has nothing to do with politics. Then we really should step back and say, well, by teaching this, you know, whose knowledge is this? Who's getting favored by this being the, the thing that matters in our schools? Um, and if we don't consider that and don't embrace the transformative power of education, then the same education can be used just to reproduce the society that we already have and just keep things you know, in, in the sad state that some of us think things are in. You good? All right. Now, approaching mathematics through a social justice context has been proposed and used by some as a way to, again, address the, the issues that confront urban youth from historically marginalized communities. And as we just saw, the idea of education for liberation, that's not new. That's been around for decades. Freire was in the 1970s, I believe, was one of the um, books that I cite. But it's only recently that this is being put onto mathematics, because mathematics tends to be thought of as just a neutral subject. And so this is kind of like coming to light now. Uh, the political nature of math and math education is highlighted in this quote, uh, which I think this quote is brilliant. Um, especially the part that says, you know, only in school do we count without a social purpose of some kind. Everywhere else, when you count, it means something. You're counting for a reason. The numbers you come up with, they're, they're you know, pushing some sort of agenda or keeping some things a certain way. So I really like that quote. Do we get, I have an example that maybe might also shed a little light. Um, and this idea of math not being a neutral subject. There's a, an author by the name of Tate who wrote about an example. I always say it's Metro cards because I can't remember where he was and whether or not they were called Metro cards. But basically the students were doing problems and one of the problems had to do with the fact that you had a Metro card, the Metro card is being used by someone to go to and from work um, you know, each day this week and you're trying to figure out if it makes sense to buy the Metro card where you pay as you go, or to buy the Metro card where you pay a little bit more, but you can go as many times as you want. And the correct answer was that you should buy the one where you pay as you go. But in this one particular school, a lot of the students were getting the question wrong, and they were saying that you should buy the other one. And it's just, this doesn't make any sense. And so Tate goes and he starts talking to the student, and he realizes that they're basing this on their own experiences. So they're not living in a house where that one individual is going to work you know, each morning at 9 and coming back each night at 5 and therefore only making five trips a week. They're coming from families where maybe their parents work multiple jobs. Um, maybe when I come home with that Metro card, I pass it off to you and you go do what you need to do. So if we don't consider things like this, then you're telling a group of students that they don't know the math. Eventually, they're just going to get disengaged and drop off the radar, which isn't what we want, because we didn't acknowledge where it is that they're coming from and what ideas and knowledges they're bringing um, to the classroom 
or to whatever a situation we're, we're working with them in. See, if I wait too long, I have to click it twice. Nope. There you go. Uh, so some scholars, and there's a little argument as to whether or not these are two distinct things or how much overlap there is. But some scholars divide math into two areas. One is called dominant math. Um, and if you just stop for a second and think about what you normally think about when you think of math, chances are that's what you're thinking about. Right? So you remember calculus class and you say, okay, that's what we were talking about. That's the theoretical, formal, you know, valued by society kind of math. All right. The other one is called critical mathematics. And sometimes I use critical math and math for social justice interchangeably. I don't know how good that is. Um, but this is mathematics that acknowledges the positioning of students as members of a society where issues of power are in existence and that tries to center the mathematics and center the, the problems and the learning around the experiences of the students that are, are there. In, in their classroom. And so now we move to this. What's math for social justice? Well, this is a little bit of a debate, too. You have the people that say, oh, this means we need equal access. Everybody's got to be able to take the same upper level challenging math classes. And then you have the people that say, well, if they take the same math classes, they might not get the same thing out of it. So what we really need is equal outcomes. We want to make sure that everybody walks out knowing the same stuff or able to do the same things. So the four bullet points I have here are what I use, and I just kind of pick and choose from the, from the different literature to come up with this. So the first is access to high quality upper level math for all students, uh, math that's currently valued by society. If this is what it takes to get you to the next place, then we better make sure that as students you have this information. Um, the second is the recentering of the curriculum around the experiences of marginalized students so that there's a connection between what you're learning and what's happening in, in your life experiences. Uh, but if we just do that part, then, then we miss out on the first thing. And then what's well, great that you know all of this stuff, but you can't do anything with it because you're still on the outside, so to speak. Um, next is the use of math as a critical tool for understanding social life. And finally, it's action towards some sort of change. Because we can all sit around in class learning all these wonderful things, and if we don't do anything with it, then we might end up really frustrated because now we thought about the problem too long and we're kind of stuck. Sure. Can I actually go back to the previous slide? Sure. There you go. The, the upper level math. Mm -hmm. What's an example of an upper level math? Are you talking about a specific course or a kind of math? Like algebra versus calculus? Yeah. The, the, um, one of the, the research points to a key difference between the people that have algebra and the people that don't. Um, there are researchers by the name of Moses and Cobb who started something called the Algebra Project. And what they did is that they related um, access to algebra and an understanding of algebra. They said that that was equal, you know, getting that for these students was equal to having uh, voting for blacks during the civil rights era. That without this, you can't fully participate in society. So at the very lower level, we would say at least algebra. Um, but when, when you get to, you know, when, when you get to college, you usually walk into pre-calculus. And if you're better prepared, you walk into calculus. And so I would argue that you would, depending on what you wanted to do, would need, a, would need that. But they say the base is, is algebra. Yeah. They, uh, the algebra project, I think, is based in Mississippi. And they, uh, they have a very extensive website that you can you can check out. Okay. All right. I just want to keep a check on the time. All right. So th this is, these are just some characteristics of what, what this might look like in class. You're using math to understand social issues. You're centering the problems around students' experiences. They're uh, investigating things that are interesting to them. They're working together. They're coming up with conjectures and testing them and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I have a few slides which I'm calling filler slides. That's my filler slide. Basically means if I need to talk more, we talk more. Um, so here's an activity that we might do, uh, which involves finding the area between two curves. And I guess if you are in math, you would say, oh, yeah, we do that in calculus, right? Um, so I don't know. 
how well you can see this, but the, the dotted line is supposedly the ideal curve, or at least ideal to the person that put this together. You might believe something different. And if you take a point like uh, 2020, what that would tell you is that in the ideal line, 20, the 20 poorest percent of society would own 20% of the wealth. And the poorest 50 own 50, the poorest 100 own 100. So it kind of like looks like that. The darker curve is what's actually happening. Um, and this was actually in 1970, so this was a while ago. And what you could say is, well, the gap between, the area between the two curves might tell us something about what's happening here with the distribution uh, of income. Um, so it's one way that you could use mathematics to say, look, this is what we have. This tells us something about what's going on in society. And this is actually in a valued language that we can turn around and use to, to maybe argue that some changes need to be made. This is one of the cartoons that I used with the students in my class, or in my class, with the teachers in my uh, study. I used it with the students in my classes, too. <laughs> All right, so we laugh, but it's telling also. Can anyone think of maybe some, some math that we can pull from this? Maybe this could be a springboard to considering other things. You we'll see, you, you could talk about deficit spending in the national debt. How is it that you could spend more than what you earn? Is it 100% everything? All right, what else could you talk about? There's the obvious one. Percents, right? You can relate it to um, you making maybe visual representations of what's going on in, in the picture, things like that. Say again? It's a social class issue. It's in the book of the book. Okay. Yeah, he has a little lunch, he has a little pail for his lunchbox, his little hat on. Credit card debt, there you go. And the little guy, he's got the clipboard. The clipboard, the fancy hat, and the pen. So, anyway. This is another quote unquote uh, filler there, but these are some other questions that you could look at with mathematics. If you look at who counts as unemployed. So if you have been unemployed for a certain amount of time and you no longer collect unemployment benefits, we don't count you anymore. And if you have a part-time job because you can't get a full-time job, but we really you want a full-time job. Well, you're not unemployed. You're working, right? So who we count affects the division that takes place and you know, where the percentage falls. And these are other kind of questions that people can explore. Right. There's a few like classic examples. This Turner and Strahan. Uh, what's happening in a lot of the schools, you probably know this, is that they take a big school and they break it up into pieces and now you have a school that has a floor in the school that, you know, in a building that now houses four or five schools and it turns out that the students were very upset because they got the top floor and it turns out that the top floor they thought was very small and that it really wasn't what they needed um, and they were concerned that the other schools in the building had more space. So what the teacher, I believe the teacher is a Font Strahan, and Turner is a professor that was, she was working with at the time. And what they did was they set up a way of measuring this. They calculated the surface area of the floor. They figured out during the change of classes how much actual space does each student of ours have on this floor. Then they went to other floors in the building and they did the same thing. And that in and of itself is great because now you have a connection between the math and this issue that was really troubling you. Um, but at the same time, then they went and they presented their findings with the district and they wrote letters to the PTA and different you know, people in, in positions of power to try to do something about what was going on. Let's see. And this is another, another um, activity that's pretty popular. Um, Peterson. Uh, wrote a book with uh, this gentleman named Gutstein, and it's called um, uh, Teaching Math by the Numbers is the subtitle. I think it might just be called Math for Social Justice, Teaching Math by the Numbers, something like that. And um, they have a lot of activities, and one of their activities is this poverty and world wealth, and I went to a workshop where they did this to us. And so you kind of like spread out the room and you put 
Asia over there and North America over there, and you pick out of a bag where you happen to have been born, because you don't really have a say in that, right? Mm -hmm. So you pick it out of a bag, and you go stand by wherever it is you were born. And then it turns out that there's lots of people congregated over here, and there's only about five people hanging out over here. And it's done accurate, or as accurately as you can, because you can't split people. So if there really, is, really are more people in this region of the world, then you know, the, the students are in proportion. And then you get cookies, and the cookies signify the wealth that that particular area of the world has. So you have some places that have maybe five people, and they've got a box of cookies. And then you've got a place that has, uh, 50 is too many, maybe has 20 people, and they have three cookies. Um, and then if you want to be a little more whatever about it, you say that you can try to rectify the situation. So you can go bargain with the other, other areas of the world. Well, actually, you guys can't, because you don't have very much money, and it takes money to travel over there. So you can't. But the rest of you can try to argue. And then you talk about what it is that's happening in the classroom and what the interactions are. All right. Um, another one of the uh, areas in the theoretical framework was communities of practice. Uh, this uh, was used as a vehicle through which to prepare the teachers. A community of practice as defined by Choi, which is, um, is a community that shares and creates real knowledge, refers to groups of people, in this case the participants and myself, who are bound by some sort of shared competence, and that according to Wenger, Leib and Wenger were the ones that came up with the term, orig term originally, they contain three dimensions, and the dimensions are mutual engagement, mutual responsibility, and a joint enterprise. And it doesn't mean, the mutual responsibility doesn't mean we all are responsible for the same stuff. It means we're all responsible for the group's work going forward. But I came in with lessons and activities, and they came in with what was happening in their classes, or maybe something they had read somewhere, or maybe some experience that they had that I didn't have. Um, uh, Wenger also describes uh, communities of practice as those where there's prolonged engagement. So we actually met 10 times. It wasn't 10 weeks, because we ended up skipping a few weeks. So it was a little longer than that. But a lot of professional development is half a day, or a couple of hours, or you know, all of election day. Right? And then you're kind of like thrown off by yourself. Granted, the 10 weeks were good. But I did learn that there were other things that I should have done after the 10 weeks. And I'll, I'll get to that later. But there are some characteristics. And uh, I also relied on the literature and teacher development, the idea that preparing teachers involves developing understandings of how people learn, how people learn differently, and like we've been talking about, how to connect what people are learning to their uh, prior experiences. Are we good with that? It's good. I could drink some water. We actually get to the study soon. One more. Are we good now? <laughs> I thought I hit it, but I didn't. There you go. So uh, also along that, that area, some, some bullet points on the thinking behind how to prepare teachers to be um, not just teachers of their subject, but also agents of change. So respecting where students are coming from developing a commitment to this kind of teaching, learning about their students, and so forth. Yes? All right. So now let's get to the actual study. Uh, the study was qualitative and ethnographic in nature. As such, it attempts to describe social life while relying on the participants' views as well as my views. And uh, we aim to explore, I aim to explore, some uh, general questions, uh, which we'll see in a minute. The story is also, par study is also participatory in nature because I was a participant in a group as well as the person that was facilitating the group. I um, mean, there was a little shift in that. In, uh, in the beginning of the group, I did a lot of the work. And towards the end of the group, they did more of the work, which was kind of nice. And I think we'll talk about that a little later, too. Um, and then the other thing was that I came to the work with specific goals in mind. 
So I saw that, or I believe that teaching math for social justice is a worthwhile endeavor. And so while I was open to other people's ideas, there was definitely the no, I'm going to push this um, idea. So I can't say that I just kind of came in blank and just learned what I learned. I, I went in there with the purpose of hopefully we'll leave thinking about these issues and hopefully it'll affect their, their teaching as well. There are actually four research, stud, uh, research questions. I've left out the fourth um, today. The fourth had uh, to do with changes in myself and um, my identity as part of, of the group. Um, but the ones we'll look at today are how the teacher's identities and their uh, ideas about what teaching math is, what math is, uh, what their job as teachers are, how that may be developed as they took part in this group. And also, the, the last one talks to the fact that this was some sort of professional development. And what characteristics of that did they like, didn't like? Might they use for something? Did they think could be better done a certain way? Because uh, looking at stuff like that might help us determine, or better determine, how we can structure these kinds of activities so that everybody gets you know, the most they can out of it, enjoys the experience, and actually finds it valuable and does something with it. The participants were actually a self-selected group. I uh, worked on a, a different study as part of my doctoral studies. Uh, we were looking at uh, teaching fellows, actually, um, in the New York City public schools. And there was a school that we worked with where they used a, a non-traditional curriculum. And that's kind of rare, because in New York there's a mandated curriculum, and they worked very hard to not have that. And so my advisor kind of thought, hmm, that might be a nice place to go, because they might be more open to stuff like this, since they're already using something that's problem-based and discovery model and, and so forth. Uh, the school is a very large, underperforming, comprehensive high school in New York City. Um, I, I'm not sure if this will come up, but if it says urban high school, that's the pseudonym I made up for it. Uh, and basically what I did was I walked in, I approached the assistant principal, of mathematics, I told her, hey, this is the study that I'm looking to do. You know, do we have your support? Can we go forward? Sounds good. Here's a email addresses for all my math teachers. I emailed all the math teachers. And it turns out that eight teachers said they were interested in the study. One person, their schedule just didn't mix with everybody else's. So that person uh, didn't participate, but everybody else did. Um, as a result of the self-selective nature of the group, the teachers were uh, in some ways not representative of those in the school's math department or the school in general. Uh, for instance, all of the participants were women, even though one third of the math department was comprised of men. Also, as compared to others in their department and the school, the participants were more likely to be from racial and ethnic backgrounds similar to their students. Uh, six of the seven identified as black or Hispanic, while in the math department and the school as a whole, that um, was less than 33% of the, of the teachers in the school. Um, also, according to data from the National Center for Educational Statistics, 25.5% of public school teachers in areas such as New York City identify themselves as black and Hispanic, which is a lot less than the participants here, even though I understand that it's a small, a small group. Uh, moreover, this group of seven teachers was less experienced than the teachers at the school. About 55% of the teachers at the school had taught in the city schools for at least three years. That doesn't sound like a lot, but in big New York City public schools, three years, something. Um, at the school where I was, <laughs> at the school where I was, I think I was there six and a half. There were about 20-something people in the math department, and I was fifth from the top in terms of people that had been there the longest, which is, again, sad. Um, I think that's a different issue, right? How do we keep people there? Uh, if you're interested, there's a gentleman named Ingersoll who does a lot of work in that, and you can read up. But I'm sure you have the same good ideas that lots of people have and just don't get used. Um, anyway, uh, aside from that, I have to find my place. 25% uh, of the 
uh, the teachers at the school had been in the public school system for over five years, but no one in the study had been there for over five years. Uh, research highlights that teachers in urban settings tend to differ from their students with respect such a, uh, to characteristics such as what we've been talking about, race, race ethnicity, family background, socioeconomic status, et cetera, which sometimes makes it difficult for them to um, relate to their students. Yet the teachers in the study tended to be from these backgrounds and have these situations. All but two reported growing up in families of low socioeconomic status. Four reported that their families had been on public assistance while they were growing up. And there were, I believe, two that had actually attended the school themselves when they, when they were younger. Okay. So we, we met as a group. Uh, weekly over a little bit more than 10 weeks, as I already said. Uh, the early sessions focused on readings, mostly theoretical and practical, about teaching math for social justice. We looked at some of the activities that have already been developed. We did some of the activities ourselves. Um, and we also talked about the, the readings. That was maybe for the first five meetings. After that, what we did was we developed a unit of study that addressed an issue that they thought would be of importance to their students and kind of took this, this approach. Uh, what they ended up settling on was the fact that they didn't think their school was doing a very good job of preparing their students for the future. So we did a comparison, a statistical comparison between their school and a few other schools using statistics from the um, school, uh, the New York City Department of Education website. And we looked at stuff like, you know, what can we answer given the statistics that were given? What can we infer from, from what's here? And in what ways is this school similar or not to schools that we think might be doing a better job or, or even a worse job? Um, and so, yeah, so that was pretty much it. In the beginning, it was mostly me kind of like pushing things. Okay, we're going to work on this now. All right, we're going to talk about this now. But the last five sessions were really nice because they really got into what they were doing. And I was like in one of the subgroups that was working on stuff, but they were really picking it up, which was nice. All right, uh, data collection. Multiple data sources were relied upon. These included uh, each teacher was interviewed before the, the group started meeting and at the conclusion. Um, so I'll refer to those as the initial and exit interviews. Participants also wrote reflections. In the first few sessions, they wrote written reflections at the end of the session. And then I started wondering, hmm, we're doing this stuff throughout. We talk about it. It might be nice if before we talk about it, we spend some time, write a little bit, and then talk about it, and I can collect that too. And Michael Cripps isn't here, but that would have been perfect for the writing across the curriculum stuff. So we'll have to get him in. Um, they also kept a running journal. And some wrote more and some wrote less. And that was sort of like on their own if things came to them while, while during the week or things like that. Uh, the group sessions were videotaped, so I have like 20 hours of videotape, which sounds good, but it also sounds like a lot. So I haven't gone through the 20 hours of videotape, but one day I would love to. Did you take the sessions just for the discussion, or were you taping it for just to you know, observe your, your group, like to observe body language? Or Actually, that's one of the things I looked at. I looked at the, um, what did I call it? The, the nature and development of the group session. So who, who talked more, who talked less, who talked after who. In the beginning, it was very nice. I would say, some, well, not very nice, but I would say something and there'd be a, a pause. You would say something and there was no pause. Da, 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 da. Then I would say something and they'd be like, yeah, well, um, da, da, you know, so there was a little like, uh, so I did look at stuff like that. I'm not going to talk about that today, but that was one of the things. One of the ideas was if we're trying to develop projects that, that stem from the student's interest, then I'm trying to develop projects that stem from the teacher's interest or what we think, you know, what they might think that the students are, are going to pick up on. And so that was one of the things, yeah, who talks after who. And, yeah, yeah, that when you were talking about is this finished or is there more? Uh, one of the more is to really look at the videos and, and, in small increments and try to make distinctions such as that. Yeah, definitely. Because um, we want our students engaged in class, so at the same time, we want our teachers engaged when they're learning, too. Uh, last was there was a journal that I kept. Um, and that had two purposes. One was to see how my thinking might change throughout time. 
One was to go back, read the, look at the videotape and think, gee, next time we might want to, blah, 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 blah. So it was kind of informing what was going on. And it's also a way of seeing you know, where your own biases might lie when you look at it you know, a couple months later. And then the analysis went through um, uh, coding, basically. And uh, the theory developed from the codes that came out of the data that I, that I collected. So now we have some findings. All right. Uh, the findings show that the teachers were actually acutely aware of the injustices that their students face. They were aware of their students' home lives, poor schooling, and the lack of opportunity available to them and their families. Uh, as I said before, a lot of them were from these same backgrounds, and they shared in, in the students' experiences. Many saw themselves as being able to succeed because of their reliance upon education, and so this kind of put them in a very awkward position. Because at one, in one instance, they're looking at education as a way to, to lead to future success. But at the same time, they're in a system that they don't think is helping their students. Um, so the, the first quote there, actually, they're both by, the, both quotes are by Melissa. And all the names are pseudonyms, so, so you know. Uh, but basically, uh, her quote here highlights that they saw the public school uh, where they taught as a producer, not of leaders, but of servants, and that they were afraid that their students were being done a disservice and that they were struggling with this. And that the bottom quote is really telling. I mean, if there were two teachers in the study that had young sons, and neither of them said they would ever let their son go to this school. And so that tells us something if you're in the school. I don't have any kids, but if I did, they wouldn't have gone to the school I taught at either. You know, and that's something. Um, also, neither of those two teachers, the ones that had the young sons, uh, I think one of the sons was five, and the other one, second or third grade, he would come sometimes. He was the unofficial cameraman. And so he would kind of check in and be like, you got to lean in a little, Ma, I can't see you. And uh, then when the tape would run, he would change it for us. Um, but um, neither of them were at the school teaching the year that the study took place. They were the, uh, there the year prior and had left. Um, one went to a suburban school that she had attended, and the other went to a private school. All right. The teacher's initial ideas about social injustice was that it's prevalent, something that the students, and in may, many cases themselves, had to deal with constantly, and that it was better addressed through school rather than in school. So if you go to school and you get all of this um, preparation together, then you might be able to overcome these issues, not because we're talking about them in class, which is kind of where the math for social justice is going. Um, and the reasons they stated that they were interested in the study was because of their love of math and their interest in social justice issues. But they kind of weren't sure of how you put that together um, in, in the beginning. Although I shouldn't say. I should say that they had ideas, obviously, about this. It wasn't necessarily, though, that their ideas were congruous with what's in the literature. But they did have ideas as to you know, what it might mean, although it was a little, a little shaky. So uh, as, they, as they were introduced to these activities and lessons, they started to see the political nature of mathematics teaching. And they started to realize how math might be used to highlight these injustices. They really realized that the power of math to talk about these issues was you know, pretty strong. And um, one of the teachers, Vanessa, she spoke a lot about ra raising awareness within her students about these different issues. And she had already started to do a few things like this with her class um, prior to my even knowing her. Uh, what happened was that they, uh, students would come to class late. And she was, why are you coming to class late? You should have been here already. And the students argued that they were coming in late because there were too many students that had to go through the scanners at the same time. And so you know, then I would just tell mine, show up 15 minutes earlier. But what she did instead was, well, let's figure out what the school could do so we don't have this problem. They're in a huge building that has multiple doors. But they were only using the doors in this one particular entrance. So the students did a study of how long it took students to get upstairs. And then they said if there were twice as many uh, scanning stations, it would take this long. And then they presented that to the school as something that might be a, a good alternative. Um, so she was already in, in that mode. Um, 
In terms of what they thought math for social justice would be after we started talking a little bit more, some of them saw it as like a hook. That isn't the end in and of itself. That's just a way of getting people interested. Um, some people uh, really, like Lena really took it on as like, this is a way we can, we can make arguments and we can further uh, what we believe in. And she was so strong to this and so uh, worried about the situation at her school and whether or not she could actually do this with her students that at her exit interview, she told me that she was thinking of quitting. And I sat there going, oh no, <laughs> that was not the intention. <laughs> um, and then I talked to her a little bit after that, and she said, no, I think I'm going to go teach in a middle school, because the curriculum isn't as, as rigid, at least she believed that it wasn't. And she thought she could do more of this stuff there. So then I went, OK, good. You know, we need them. We don't want to lose them like this. Um, one of the things that they uh, were concerned at in the beginning was that examining these social issues wouldn't empower their students, but rather would paralyze them. Uh, despite this, so you, you know what I get, what, what I mean by that, right? The more we study this, the more we realize, wow, how, how messed up are things here? And we don't want to sit here just kind of being like, hmm. Right? So the, the next step of having some sort of action is really, really important. Um, this is Ellen's response to some materials from the New York City uh, New York Civil Liberties Union on um, the, it's called the uh, school to prison pipeline. And we looked at a few of their materials. And she started, uh, the video had students talking about what they had done. And that's when she started to say, well, if there's opportunities, not just to raise our awareness, but to try to do something about it, you know, then that might be more worthwhile, because then we won't be paralyzing people. And in fairness, a lot of our activities, what we did in the group, stop that awareness. Like I didn't go and take it to the next step and say, we're going to all go out and do this. You know, it was sort of like, well, when you do this with your class, that's what you're going to do. You know, and now you sit there going, well, if I did that again, you know, we would have more of the action piece in there. All right. So teacher identity, how the teachers see themselves, their roles as teachers, their roles as agents of change. Uh, initially, they had this idea that my job is to cover a certain amount of material. And so what I need to do is I need to teach the students straight math. Uh, straight math was their term for uh, dominant math. So I just have to go over what I'm supposed to go over so you can pass your test, and that's what we need to do. And Enyo was actually very, very traditional. Um, and she just had this like, well, if it has nothing to do with math, if it's not about math, I just can't do that in class because there's just no space for it. And then she was actually the one with the most dramatic change uh, because early on, she's very theoretical in how she learned. Um, even though that's not her name, I tried to be a little faithful to what their real names are. So she, um, she's a, a Nigerian um, descent, and she came uh, to the United States in the middle of high school and attended this high school. And so her, her, the teaching at it, where she's from was a lot more uh, traditional than even what they were doing in the school. So her thing was, well, the reason our students aren't learning is that we're not teaching them the straight math. We're going into all these different things. Um, but then she started thinking, wow, maybe if I paired math with social issues, the students might actually be more interested. And maybe if they were a little more interested, they would spend more time on this. And maybe if they spent more time on this, then they might learn the math better. Uh, when asked in their exit interviews about their roles as agents of change, they all pointed to changes within their classroom, which I thought was really interesting. And that's also, um, uh, what's the word, supported by the work of um, Koti, who uh, was doing a program such as this himself and found that that's what he ended up talking about as well. And I think that goes back to what I was talking about, to the fact that we did this in this little group ourselves, and we didn't jump out and do the, do the next thing. Um, the only one that was a little different in that was Vanessa, who really was talking about raising class consciousness and, and affecting broader change in society. Many of the teachers noted that they didn't initially realize the power that they had as teachers to affect change um, in, in the broader society. And they that took it to the extent of, it's not that I have this power, it's that I have this responsibility now that I know, you know, a way of, of dealing with this. Um, so that, that's um, 
some support for the activities, some things that they thought they could do. These are the concerns. They expressed some concerns, valid, definitely valid concerns about teaching this way. Uh, the first quote by Melissa is basically, uh, what about the resistance I'm going to get from my administrators and the parents and maybe even the students themselves when I try to do this? Um, there was also a concern that the, um, that teaching in this matter would take away from that more theoretical, that time on more theoretical math and then they're going to walk out the door without knowing what they need to do to do well right now. Um, and one of the nice uh, suggestions that they came up with was, well, maybe there should be two classes. There's the class where you learn the content, and then there's the class where you apply it to all of this other stuff. It's kind of nice. What I've been thinking of is it could be an after-school club, because then you're not worried about all of these other restrictions. And then you might not even be worried about the parents, because if the student is there, you know, they could choose not to be there. I don't know. I'm thinking about how to keep going with it. So that might be an idea. Uh, the concerns led many of the teachers to indicate that they would use the lessons to supplement the curriculum that they already have, but that they wouldn't use them exclusively, and that they would definitely think of them as more of add-ons and extensions to things. Um, but they also kind of suggested that even though they might not use the lessons in that way, that this would be something they would be thinking about as they were teaching and, and trying to consider um, where their students are coming from as well. Yeah, the, the suggestion about teaching it over two periods sounds great to me. I don't know that administrators are going to go for that, but it sounds great to me. <laughs> uh, they were also a little concerned with the level of the math uh, that the lessons covered. Uh, now it's a little bit different. There's a lot more materials available, but originally, or originally is not the word, a little earlier on, like a couple of years ago, there was a lot less available. And a lot of the materials focused on uh, statistics. And it wasn't necessarily higher level statistics. It was higher level reasoning using more elementary math. And so a lot of people were saying, well, there's no overlap between the higher level stuff and this. So really, we can't, we can't go do that. But um, there's a lot more available now. There's the uh, Rethinking Math book, but there's also a website called RadicalMath.org. And they just have collections of lessons and activities and things like that. We doing OK? If you don't answer, I have to answer myself, and that's sad. Are we doing OK? Yeah. All right. You can't say no anyway, right? Just OK. Did I? OK. Um, I kind of jumped to this already a little bit earlier. Basically, um, Lena is the, the teacher that eventually was, was considering whether or not she should quit. And it was because she saw, she's like, well, I always did what I was supposed to do as a math teacher, but now I see all this other stuff that I, I think I have a responsibility to do. And on top of everything else that's expected of me, this is, you know, very, very overwhelming. And in fairness, I didn't know about this stuff when I was teaching in high school. So I didn't do it. You know, and then you come in and say, well, this is great. You guys should try this. But I'm not in that school anymore. And I'm not getting so-and-so walking in the door saying, what, what's this about? And even here, I started like, doing little inklings of it because I started realizing, hmm, we have, a, we have a class. I have a class, Math for Elementary School Teachers. We do a whole section on statistics. Why aren't we using statistics about our public schools? Why aren't we using the math unit that we did in this class? You know, so that's another way that I started, I guess, having to train myself to. All right, N next few slides are about feedback about the group and the professional development activity. Um, Ellen's quote speaks to the fact that the teachers were interested in the topic. Uh, she said that this was a reason why they valued it, because I didn't have to be told to go here. I actually wanted to go here. Uh, a lot of them said that voluntarily joining the group made the experience worthwhile. Um, and that that was much better than ha being told you had to attend. I think that quote also speaks to the fact that participants uh, appreciated the fact that they had a role in what was going on. The unit that was created was developed by them. They decided on the topic. They decided on how we would approach the, the topic. 
they crafted the lessons. I mean, I crafted a few because I was in one of the subgroups as well. Um, and so having a say in the final product was valuable. Uh, Melissa's quote is sort of what a lot of teachers say, is if I can walk away with something I can use, then this is good. So. They also liked the fact that they were working with their colleagues, um, that they didn't often get opportunities to collaborate with one another. They were not great friends. Two of them were pretty good friends. The others kind of knew each other. But they, there was a way about how they talked to each other that indicated that they obviously spent time you know, outside of, of the group or outside of work together. And the level of comfort in the group allowed them to challenge one another, even though initially they wouldn't challenge me, but challenge one another. Um, and kind of pushing each other through questioning, uh, doubting people's positions. And, and they did this in a respectful manner and in an understanding, ma understanding matter. And one of their concerns was, well, I don't know if high school students can do this like this. Um, or what do I do when this escalates and gets out of hand? Um, and I think in the future, what, what makes sense is not this is what it is, here's some activities, and I'm leaving now. But here's what it is, here's some activities, now I'll follow you into class and help you set this up or you know, together work on what might make some sense. My uh, committee said that that was way too much work for a dissertation. <laughs> I'm glad they did. But again, that's a good next step. All right. Their suggestions for improvement, they had many more. I just picked the one that everybody kept saying, which is implementation. So a lot of time, the teachers, developers, they come in, they run through some activities, they never follow up with us, and then we leave. And then I see myself going, this was great, but I don't know what to do with it. And so what happens when the support's not there after the ideas were presented? Uh, so specifically with respect to these activities, they would have liked some time to see how one might facilitate such discussions with students. Or, gee, we did a nice activity on this. How might I modify that? for students of different mathematical abilities. All right. We're almost there, guys. All right. uh, so basically just putting those ideas together. Um, you know, the teachers valued having time to work together, having time to work with their peers. They liked that they worked on this unit together. This is the same thing that was in the quotes, but just kind of not in their words. Are we good? And then some recommendations for teacher development that probably have been around. I have a little arrow. Go away. There we go. I just hidden in the T now. Uh, someone said at a conference that I attended, and I would love to remember who it was that said it, but it was in the hallway one day. He said, you know, all educational reforms go through teachers. So it doesn't matter how good or how bad the, the, the idea is, if the teachers aren't on board or if the teachers aren't doing something the way it was intended to be or whatever, then it's not going to work. So if we keep this in mind and then add to the fact that teachers would use what they understand, value, and support um, more often than that which they don't, then these are things that we might keep in mind um, as valued for professional development. And if you look at them, a lot of them had to do with that community of practice thing we were talking about before, working over a, a long period of time, collaborating with your peers, having some sort of choice and investment in what it is you're doing. There are four things. There's probably more. But right now, there are four things that I wish I would have thought about a little bit more um, while I was doing this. Um, the teachers were really happy with the product we created, but in reality, the more valuable thing was the endeavor of taking an idea, crafting a math unit about, around it, and then facilitating student learning and engagement in such a unit. Um, so if, if we consider especially that math for social justice involves revolving activities around our students' experiences, then stressing the process and not just the product we came up with should, should have been um, would have, would have probably led to more effective implementation um, on the part of the teachers. Also, this idea of, again, supporting them through implementation and making sure that they uh, have opportunities to see how action comes from these sort of projects. And finally, 
getting the, the school administration on board to maybe run a club like this at the school or maybe have an elective class that some students who are you know, able to fit into their schedule can take. So this is the more work to be done thing that fits along with what um, Provost Griffith was saying. Uh, first of all, as with any study, there's limitations. Uh, first, the participants were a self-selected group and they showed interest in this from the start. And it might be different working with a group of teachers that don't have that initial interest. Um, it also might be different working with a group of teachers whose uh, beliefs and opinions and attitudes aren't as closely aligned. Um, I think it would be interesting to look now, not just on what they're doing, but follow teachers into the classroom and see if this has any effect on how they teach. Also to consider uh, what resources might be needed in order that this may be implemented. How the, that one has to do with how the experience would be different if the, the people in the group weren't so, again, closely aligned in terms of what their interests and ideas are. And then not just looking at the impact on our identities and on the teachers' identities, but the impact on the students as well. Now I want to take a little bit of time to answer some questions and hear some thoughts or comments or concerns or any suggestions you have. But before I do that, and since I hope I still have your attention, um, I wanted to say a few thank yous. So first, thank you to Provost Griffith. I guess there's no Provost Lecture Series without a Provost, so um, that would be good. Um, thank you to the Provost Lecture Series Committee for um, you know, accepting this proposal and giving me the opportunity to talk to you all, uh, specifically to Assistant Provost Henke and Dr. Laura Fishman, who helped uh, set all this up. Um, there is no poster here, but there will be a poster. And the gentleman that created the poster is named Curtis Thomas. And he's in the same office with Dawn and Jennifer, yes? And the guy's amazing. So even though he's not here, you know, we should thank him for the, the good job he did. And then I never really have a place for it, but I really like that quote, so I'm just going to throw it, that there. So thanks a lot for listening, and if you have questions or comments or thoughts or concerns, shoot them out. Hi. 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 We've never had a dead person in social work. Oh, okay. Um, the reason I'm saying that is the first thing I wanted to make a comment that your description of the um, distributing the world's wealth mm -hmm. experience of your class, I've done with social welfare classes, mm -hmm. social welfare policy classes, it really drives the point home really yeah. well. So I think it's interesting that from two different fields from, right, yeah. that experience. The second thing I'm wondering about is, is there in the literature, are there comparative studies, are there studies comparing the outcomes, the student outcomes, of those who've been taught using mathematics, you know, the distributive justice mm -hmm. paradigm compared to traditional paradigm? Are there differences in level of student interest in math, desire to learn math, comprehension? I think you can find studies that speak to the level of interest and the amount of time spent in, in those classes and the engagement with the material. I, I don't know of any studies that go into the stuff that administrators and, and would be interested in, which is, well, do they better, do better on their tests when they finish? Well, do they move further along in school? I think the reason for that is that this is still kind of on the outside, and so there are pockets of schools that are doing these things, but not as extensive as we would like. Um, there might be stuff out there that I'm just not aware of yet, but that's definitely a good next step because if you want to justify why this might work, it, some people's eyes, it's not enough to say they're interested and they'll, they'll work more. You know, we have to say w what comes out of it. Did you have a comment or a yeah. question to that? Well, yeah. Also, thanks. Wonderful job. Good luck with your work. Great. Thank you. It's very, very important. It's applicable to us here at Northview as well, and I'm hoping we're all seeing some of that relevance. Um, as an anthropologist mm -hmm. is engaged in the literature, um, there's been an unbroken WC since Pablo Freire in the concept of participatory actual research. Mm -hmm. That the researcher's identity is being, you know, part of that process. The teacher's identity through the process of reflexivity mm -hmm. has been engaged. The data has been proven time and time again, especially since you know what child left behind. Right. That process cannot be separated from outcomes. Mm -hmm. We've proven that as a, you know anthropological researchers in education since. Um, Paul Willis, 
um, right. feminists like uh, Belt Books. Mm -hmm. We've been demonstrating that over time and time again, the information is there. It just needs to be connected to, as you said, to this people topic. Actually right. Yeah. So yeah. how do we do no, that? No, you're as, right. As, as a planet of college, you know, how, we, how we get that message across is really the issue. And right. I really applaud your attention. Yeah. But no, the, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of work on how valuing where your students are coming from and, and taking their experiences and centering work around them is valuable to students. I don't think I've seen anything that says this math for just social justice class versus this class. But, but, but the other stuff is there. The yeah. This is the very problem that they're trying to solve. Like why mm -hmm. math, why women can do less well at math because they're told they're bad at it. Mm -hmm. But people of color in poor neighborhoods have less resources. These are all directly connected to the gender relationship. The data's already been collected. So, I mean, it's. I will go with the student first, and then we'll go with you. I think this is. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah, you're, you're oh, next. I'm sorry. Oh, you're not. I am so sorry. I thought you were. In many respects, we're all students. Yes. Oh, that's true. There you go. Um, um, that threw me off. We can come back to you. No, um, part of the, I think, maybe I'm not understanding some of what um, math for social justice is, but it would seem to me that the idea of having an elective class or having, like having that two section deal or having a club um, works against. It's still outside, yeah, um, you're absolutely right. It's still outside of what you'd like. Yeah. So, so I am but I don't know if we can get, integrated. right, I don't know if we can get to integrated without starting somewhere. Okay. But you're absolutely right. If you have a group after school, it's easy to ignore the group after school. It's easy to say that only certain students are taking advantage of what's going on after school. Um, but at the same time, if you walk into a school and say, we're going to do this, there are schools that are doing it, and there are wonderful places that are, that are doing that, but they're like pockets. Is that where you're going? Yeah. I thought I was understanding the way in which it was supposed to be integrating with the dominant. Yeah, I think But I also had a question about, um, I can't pronounce the name of the and you? And you? Yeah. Um, were there other immigrants in your group? And because there's a comfort to math in that you can say, well, this is transferable in a way. Um, it's it's being stripped of, some, right. which you're arguing it's not. Um, were there other immigrants in your group that related to math in that way that said, I just want the numbers? Um, she was the only one that was, you know, born outside the United States. Um, there was a, one of the teachers had attended one of the um, specialized high schools, and so she also had a very um, solid and very theory-driven math background. She wasn't as extreme as her in her original um, statements, but she also kind of, I did well. You know, why wouldn't they do well if we did this? But not, not to the same extreme as she did. And what I did was I went online and I said, female Nigerian names. And Enyo you know, meant something really nice. And I forgot already, but at the time it meant something nice. So I'm like, all right, that, that'll be her name. So is that something nice? Maybe it just means something nice? I don't know. Um, Linda, you had a um, Just to talk to the question of student outcomes with you know, math. And I'm, I'm, this was at the high school level? Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, Leslie Kyler and I are working on that, uh, oh. also an NSF grant, looking at um, restructuring classrooms at, in the high school. And what we're finding is that with these, and again, it's, it, it's related to the idea of social justice in that it's um, student-centered student and student-led and peer tutoring and all that. And the preliminary data that's coming out is those classes are when they take the regents again. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the participants have either failed the regents once or are considered at risk for failing. And those classes, those restructured classes, are posting twenty point gains over the controlled non restructured classroom. I mean, the numbers are astounding. So there is something to be said, you know, for uh, the, the the outcome. You know, if we if we are, you know, by by design, we, ha we have to, sh you know, that's what principals want to see. When you go into a school right. and you say, I've got this, you know, great program, they'll say, well, show me the numbers. 
you know, what, what is it going to do to our bottom line in numbers? I mean, it's not just deeds and provosts. <laughs> no, no. no. I said administration. <laughs> but, it, you know, so, so absolutely yeah. there are, you know, there are student outcomes that can be, you know, can be looked at um, for restructured, pro and this is a restructuring of, 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 of teacher of professional development. Great, thank you. I, I would just add to that that you know there's when you look at inquiry based classrooms mm -hmm. where you still have a curriculum. So you're still, you know, the, the inquiry is still driven by whatever that curriculum is. And then you free up the classroom for students to work in a group based environment that is not exactly the traditional environment. It allows them to engage. There's critical thinking there. You can still measure the outcomes in the traditional ways. I see this as different. Okay. I see that when you're actually building from a student agenda as opposed to an other agenda, that, that your outcomes are going to be very different. And, and my area is youth development, and so we struggle with this all the time. Because if you actually take a youth development approach to anything, then what's going to happen is you're building from where students are. And so the platforms <laughs> are very different. They're all over the place. And so your outcomes are very different. You may see that one particular student has grown incredible amounts in writing because they took on a certain aspect as the reporter in the project. But then you see somebody else really got into the measurement, right, and took on the lead role. They, had, they were the ones that were going around calculating the perimeters, and they grew in that area. So your outcome measurements, because they're not flexible in the educational system that we have, they don't speak to it yet. Mm -hmm. And we haven't gotten to a place in our educational system where we have put a priority on student ownership, student engagement, critical thinking as the driving force. We are still a top-down content heavy. Mm -hmm. So until we really rectify what it means to have a student-driven, student agenda, you know, we, we really are not going to settle the outcomes issue. That's very well put. Jane? Uh, I wondered if you had thought about or see any connections um, uh, with the ideas of NCTF, such as connections, problem solving, communication, and the activities of the Math for Social Justice. I, I think you just hit it. Um, <laughs> you said problem solving? Here's a problem. Here's something that's going on in society. Let's use math to tackle the problem. Communication? Well, now we have this information. Let's speak to who we need to speak to. to change the policy or change something that might make the situation better. So, um, so, you, you, so I, I do intersect. think that, 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 that those intersect. Yeah, I definitely do. So, so there are things going on with, within the professional organizations that align That's, to the directions that you're talking about. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I was interested in the comment that the teacher made about the potential demoralization mm -hmm. that students can encounter. I'm wondering if they talk about that anymore or what you see as a because the issue there is that as they constructed their own knowledge, they might have reached a point where they became disempowered, right? Or realized the, the limitations of what they can, all the examples you gave were examples where they sort of took that and found out something that was empowering, right? Right. Like the teachers were sort of saying that, I recognize this could be a potential problem. They, they, they did talk about that. They talked, especially in the beginning, they talked a lot about if, if all we do is raise awareness, then now we're all aware of how bad things are. <laughs> well, that's not going to do us any good. Um, they, they also talked about um, the kinds of projects they might want to take on. And a lot of times they were smaller things that they thought they had more control over. So that study that the, the teacher did before I got there about the, the, the getting online and going through scanning was something that they thought they might actually have a chance towards changing. The um, unit that the teachers created had to do with looking at what's going on at the school and seeing if we can make the school better because they thought they could make recommendations that might actually be taken up. So a lot of what they kind of saw as potential projects were smaller things as opposed to we're going to go and change racial profiling. Let's go. No, they were more like within their communities and, and, and within the school, like smaller, smaller But do I understand that that's part of the pedagogy, the potential for that, that you sort of have to figure out what you do with what information yeah. you figure out to use, right? Definitely. You definitely have to figure out what to do with it. And I think, honestly, that I could have done a much better job of 
hey, we figured this out. Now let's take what we learned in our session today and go do something about it. And I didn't go that extra step. So I wouldn't particularly expect them to, to see it, especially to a, a broader uh, kind of issues, because I didn't go there either. You know, so you, you learn stuff next time. Uh, like everyone else has been saying, I really enjoyed this presentation. And I see myself doing some of this in my philosophy classes. Uh, but one of the things that occurred to me was that the very premise that you begin with, the idea of social justice as equality of opportunity, is a version of social justice. In other words, uh, it's, it's one that may resonate with a group of faculty who've chosen to work in a public university. Mm -hmm. um, but what, when I first started at, at teaching at Villanova, we had one of those student groups who were affiliated with the National Conservative Group that would report mm -hmm. how many examples you used that were considered to be progressive and as such biased. Um, and, and I didn't score well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'd score well either. <laughs> but but I'm, I'm, just, I'm just wondering uh, if this idea of social justice, given that it, it, it's, it's not neutral, you know, it's a normative idea, uh, does that come up in these discussions? Or perhaps in the literature, is there acknowledgment that, well, this is a particular version of social justice that not everyone is going to buy into? No, you're absolutely right. The, the graph with the line going this way is not necessarily what everybody would think is fair. Um, or right, or how things should be. Uh, the, the teachers in the study were all pretty aligned with what you might believe in and what I might believe in, and what, they were all kind of cohesive. But there is um, a lot of this stuff used to be found not in necessarily the uh, NCTM journals that you might expect, or the AERA journals, the American Educational Research Association. You'd find them kind of like in these radical math websites or a, a group called Rethinking Schools, kind of like pushing their way in. Um, and there is a lot of talk about the resistance that these kind of ideas might face from groups and people that don't see this as just, see some other version of what just is. So there is talk about that um, in the literature as one of the issues. And you're absolutely right. We need to acknowledge that I make it right. I believe this, so I got to make it sound good and say, yeah, this is what we need to do. But you're right, it's, all, it's one version of what just might be. So you're absolutely right. Anyone else? I wanted to make a comment on uh, the provost's question about um, higher mathematics. Okay. Um, there's a big difference between what's traditionally taught and the level at which new mathematics has been developed and in principle could be taught. Okay. So for example, in the middle 1950s, two mathematicians named Gale and Chaplin found a method that if you have boys ranking girls, who their favorites are, and the girls ranking the boys, how to pair them off so that nobody would uh, prefer to be married to someone else than to who the method assigned to them. And that method was used to uh, design the way hospitals and residents uh, are assigned. The residents wanted to go to hospitals, and hospitals have rankings for the different medical students, and they do it so that they get these stable outcomes. Now, you could easily teach that in high school, but, um, but it's not traditional. It's not harder than factoring polynomials. It's just right. different from factoring right. polynomials. Yeah. So a couple of years ago, Boston uh, used the variant of this system when they broke up a lot of these schools. Instead of having neighborhood schools, the idea was the students could choose where they wanted to go. So the students ranked the schools, but here the, stu the schools didn't have rankings so much for the students, but they had uh, what are called preference requirements. In other words, if your sibling went to this school already, then that student would have priority over other people, and that sort of thing was a convenience for parents. And Boston adopted a system which for assigning people to schools, which they highly touted because they claimed huge numbers of people got uh, their first or second choice. It was like, this, this system was great because everybody, but it turned out that the system Boston was using, which was different from the method that's used for assigning residents in hospitals, uh, it turns out that that system um, doesn't discourage the people who are applying to the schools from lying about their preferences. <laughs> and so it turned out that because they didn't understand how the system worked, they thought that by saying this, that, and the other thing, so yes, they were getting their first choice, but that wasn't their real first choice. 
And it turns out that if you use the scale Shapley method um, in a certain way, then it um, doesn't encourage you to lie because you can never do better by lying. You can only do worse. Uh, so there are a lot of things like this uh, that, whether that's higher mathematics or just non-traditional mathematics, is the crux of you know, a lot of the discussions. Well, all right, if everybody's done, I think we have a question. Oh, no, we might have a question. Uh, we might have some announcements first. Uh, on behalf of the Provo Lecture Series, I want to thank everyone for coming. And of course, we want to thank Lydia for this very engaging and significant presentation and from a discussion that, that it really was very meaningful for, for many of us. Um, our next event will be in March on the 22nd, which is a Monday, same room, same time. Yolamina Girardi, Girardi, excuse me, from biology, recurrent miscarriages, can we prevent fetal rejection? So that also should be some very uh, significant and valuable research. The application to make presentations for the fall semester is now available uh, either through me directly, you can email me, or I think it's on the Provost uh, website, it's been posted. Our deadline is April 22nd, which sounds far away, but uh, March begins next week. So we encourage uh, people from all disciplines, from all ranks of the faculty to uh, submit applications. Thank you very much. Well, I want to pleasantly surprise Lydia by telling her that we do have a poster. <laughs> Here it is. So, cool that moment here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great. And it's beautiful. In keeping with our traditions, there shall be food. <laughs>